Welcome back to Introduction to Horticulture, Hort 1100. Today's lecture covers Unit 6 and Unit 7 on plant propagation. In today's lecture, we are going to look at and define plant propagation and describe important principles in propagation. List and describe the reasons for sexual propagation. List and describe the conditions necessary for seed germination. Understand types of seed dormancy and the methods used to overcome them. List and describe reasons for and methods of asexual propagation. And identify various types of asexual cuttings. There are many ways of propagating or reproducing plants. Propagation can be defined as creating more plants from parts of existing plants. These parts can be seeds, which is also known as sexual propagation, or leaves, stems, or roots, which is known as vegetative or asexual propagation. The most common method of reproducing flowering plants, as well as vegetable and cereal crops, is through the use of seeds. This is a sexual process and requires the union of pollen with the egg inside of the ovary. Male and female cells may be from the same parent, known as self-pollination, or from separate parents, known as cross-pollination. Seeds are a means of rapidly increasing the number of a certain plant and are used to grow many of our important food crops as well as ornamental plants for the landscape. However, not all plants come true to seed. When we are talking about plants that come true to seed, that means that they reproduce exact duplicates of the parents from seeds. Wheat and barley are examples of plants that do not come true from seed. Other plants such as rhododendrons, azaleas, and apples do not come true from seed as well. In the horticulture industry, many plants are started from seed because it is a quick and economical method. For successful germination, the proper environmental and cultural conditions must be provided. These conditions include temperature, moisture, light, and medium. Some other advantages of sexual propagation include the rapid increase of the number of plants, and seeds can be stored for long periods of time and still germinate. There are also disadvantages of sexual propagation that include genetic variability, which is not a disadvantage if you are a plant breeder, but growers want uniformity in plants. A second disadvantage of sexual propagation is it takes a long time for some plants to reach maturity. Asexual reproduction is required to produce clones or exact duplicates of plants that are sterile or plants that are difficult to grow from seed. Asexual propagation includes methods such as stem cuttings, root cuttings, leaf and leaf bud cuttings, layering, grafting, or budding, special structures, micropropagation, as well as division. Vegetative propagation has many advantages. These advantages include genetic uniformity or clones. They are again used for plants that do not produce seed, and you could avoid or reduce juvenility with vegetative propagation methods. This figure is showing you some of the various vegetative or asexual propagation methods we discussed in the previous slides. Again, these include methods such as stem cuttings, root cuttings, leaf and leaf bud cuttings, layering, grafting, budding, special structures, micropropagation, as well as division. The basic parts of a seed are the seed coat, the endosperm, which is stored plant food, and the embryo. The seed coat is the outside covering of the seed that protects the embryo plant. The seed coat makes it possible for seeds to be transported and stored for long periods of time. The endosperm, or stored plant food, is the food storage tissue that nourishes the embryonic plant during germination or the first start of growth in a seed. The third part of the seed is the embryo, or embryonic plant. The embryo is a new plant that is developed as a result of fertilization. During germination, 
it extends its root and seed leaves to form a new plant. There are several different conditions necessary for seed germination to occur. Once dormancy is overcome, the seed needs adequate moisture, oxygen, proper temperature, and light or darkness. Some seeds need light to germinate, while some require darkness in order to germinate. Nutrients are not needed during germination since the seed has its own food source. A seed will stay in dormancy when a seed fails to germinate because of their own physiology, anatomy, or a combination of both. There are a couple special treatments of seeds for germination to occur. Scarification is the soaking or scratching of the hard seed coat using sandpaper or an acid bath. In nature, this occurs through wetting and drying, freezing and thawing, passing through an animal's digestive tract, or by fire. Another treatment is stratification. In this treatment, seeds are placed in moist medium and stored at cool temperatures. In nature, this occurs naturally during the fall and winter months. The best medium for germination has a favorable pH level and an adequate supply of plant nutrients. It is firm, porous, uniform in texture, sterile, and free of weeds, insects, and pathogenic disease organisms. A good germination medium contains one or more of the following ingredients. Peat moss, which is partially decomposed vegetation that has been preserved underwater. The peat is collected from marshes, bogs, or swamps, and has a very high capacity for holding water. It contains about 1% nitrogen, and it is low in phosphorus and potassium. The next one's perlite. Perlite is a gray-white material of volcanic origin that expands when it's heated. It is most commonly used to improve aeration of media. Horticultural grade perlite consists of large particles, thereby providing good drainage and aeration. Vermiculite is a very lightweight material that encompasses a large group of hydrated laminar magnesium aluminum iron silicates, which resemble mica. It is neutral, it has a pH of 7, and has a very high water holding capacity. Sand is the last one. Construction grade sand is the best type of sand to use because it is more porous than some other sands, thereby allowing better aeration and drainage. Sand particles do not hold plant nutrients in the medium as strongly as particles of soil or of peat moss. Sand is seldom used now. Perlite and vermiculite are used instead. Many seeds are planted directly in the permanent growing area. This is known as direct seeding. It is the most economical method of seeding. Plants such as corn, melons, beans, beets, peas, lettuce, carrots, and most other vegetable crops are grown by this process. Indirect seeding is the process in which a seed is sown in place separate from where the plants will eventually grow to mature. The seedlings are transplanted one or more times before reaching the permanent growing area. Some vegetables such as tomatoes, peppers, cabbage, and eggplant, and many annuals are generally started in flats or plug trays and then transplanted. As business persons who must operate at a profit to survive, commercial plant growers must be sure that their plants are ready for sale at the correct time for outdoor planting and for holidays. Seeds must be planted on certain dates so that the resulting seedlings are ready for transplanting at the proper time. To sow seeds properly, follow the directions on the packet for spacing. Planting depth is generally about two times the size of the diameter of the seed unless the seed need, needs light for germination. As soon as the seeds are sown, they are then labeled with a name, variety, and date. All labels should be printed clearly with pencil or a waterproof marking pen. Ballpoint pens should not be used 
since, it's, since it washes out when seedlings are watered. Water aids in germination by making the seed coat soft so that the embryonic plant can germinate. Water itself is an important nutrient and also acts to dissolve other nutrients present in the growing medium, making them available to growing plants. Again, water imbibition is the first step in germination. This is the uptake of water by the dry seed. Seed flats containing seeds for germination should be located in a semi-shaded area of the greenhouse and receive a bottom heat of 65 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Except for cool season crops, they generally germinate well without bottom heat. After the seeds are sown, the container should also be covered with a plastic dome or clear plastic film to retain humidity. The covering should not touch the medium while the seeds are germinating. And the proper seedling medium is low in fertilizer elements. Seedlings should be fed weekly with a water-soluble fertilizer once they're germinated. As the seedlings approach transplanting size, a cooler temperature of 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit is provided to prepare the seedlings for shock of transplanting. This is known as the hardening off process. It helps plants prepare for the stresses of the new environment to decrease transplant, transplant shock. The process may also include modest withholding of water to slow active growth. At this time, light and wind are generally increased slowly. After seeds germinate, they develop seed leaves or cotyledons, the first leaves to appear on the plant. The plant should be allowed to grow until the first true leaves are present before it is transplanted. When handling seedlings, hold them by their true leaves using the thumb and forefinger. Do not hold them by the stem, since the seedling could die if the stem is badly bruised. If you are transplanting from plug trays, push up with a dibble. A dibble is a pointed hand tool for making holes in the ground for your seeds or young plants. The following chart from your textbook gives you seeding information for growing plants to market size within a greenhouse. As you can see in the chart, it gives you the number of weeks to keep in packs versus a pot, the number of days to germination, and additional observations to follow. This chart shows you the same information except for seeding information for growing some vegetable crops. Seed catalogs will also give you the same exact information. The most commonly used and commercially important method of asexual reproduction is propagation by the use of cuttings. Cuttings are leaves or pieces of stems or roots used for propagating more plants. There are stem cuttings, which can include hardwood, semi-hardwood, softwood, or herbaceous. And there's also leaf cuttings, leaf bud cuttings, and root cuttings. It is always important to follow some important principles in propagation. You always want to start out with the health of the stock plants and make sure they are free from disease or pests. Practice sanitation. Use growth regulators such as auxins that promote rooting. And you want to limit the transpirational loss of water. When propagating plants, cuttings should be placed in a high humidity environment and you want to decrease the leaf surface area. You also want to make sure that you maintain polarity. Cuttings are affected by gravity or polarity and need to be planted with the right side up. Cuttings planted vertically and with the correct end up will have a much higher success rate. Propagators traditionally cut the root flat or straight across the top end and a slant on the bottom end. This method of cutting ensures that it is possible to recognize the top of the cutting and the bottom of the cutting and that it is planted correctly. You also want to make sure that you use a sterile media with high porosity when taking cuttings. Additionally, use bottom heat or correct temperatures to make sure you have a good success rate. Herbaceous cuttings are made from succulent greenhouse plants such as the geranium, chrysanthemum, coleus, Swedish ivy, and carnation. 
Most florist crops are propagated this way. Cuttings are made three to four inches long with leaves left on the upper or terminal end. Several cuttings can be obtained from a plant stem. This allows the horticulturalist to obtain many more cuttings than if only one leaf or stem tips are used. The leaves are trimmed with three or four leaves left remaining on the top end. As you are preparing your basic stem cuttings, make as many three to four inch cuttings from each stem or shoot as possible. Again, you want to include two to three nodes on each cutting. The cutting is made below a node at the bottom and above a node at the top as shown in the figure. After you take the cutting, remove the lower leaves. You may apply a rooting hormone, but it is usually not necessary because rooting is rapid for herbaceous cuttings. Place the cutting half its length into a moist, well-drained medium and label. Place the cuttings in a high humidity environment because of the loss of moisture through transpiration. As time nears for the cuttings to be rooted, open the plastic covered container or go to the misting propagation bench and check the cuttings by holding each cutting and tugging gently. If the cutting does not easily slip out or resistance is felt, rooting has started or roots have developed. You want to transplant when a well-developed root system has formed on the cutting. If there are no roots, merely close the container or leave the cuttings under mist and wait another 7 to 10 days. As long as the cutting has not rooted or turned dark and is holding its leaves, it will probably root if time is given. Growth on the tip or sides of the cutting is normal but may not indicate that the cutting has actually rooted. Another type of softwood cutting is a leaf cutting. Leaf cuttings are made from many foliage plants such as the African violet, peperomia, as well as the snake plant. A leaf cutting consists of a leaf blade and petiole, or in some plants, just a leaf blade. A second type of softwood cutting is known as the leaf bud cutting. Leaf bud cuttings are made from plants that do not propagate easily from just leaf cuttings. Examples here are the jade plant, pothos, and rhododendrons. Leaf bud cuttings consist of a leaf blade, a petiole, and an axillary, or portion of the node with meristematic tissue present. That concludes the lecture on Unit 6 and Unit 7 on plant propagation. If you have any additional questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. Have a nice day.